the the topic we've chosen to speak about today is developing indian food palate to international standards um i'm i'm going to read a little between the lines i think it's it's more about um talking about how the indian palate is evolving and um going from you know a very traditional uh food uh repertoire which was restricted to dals and curries and rotis and 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 rice preparations to uh something which is a little bit more world facing and a little bit more curious and explorative uh with us we have uh, a very illustrious uh, panel today humble to be around you guys uh we have chef sandeep pandey the chef of uh, renaissance convention center uh to my right is gauri of course uh, who runs the iconic table and i uh, safe to say she has broken quite a few rules and and torn a new path um on my left is um chef sudhir pai uh, executive chef of holiday inn chef uh, sandeep uh, and chef kedar bobde are from hath regency um so i'm i'm just going to start with you chef pande and um uh i i what we have seen in the last 10 years has been unprecedented in terms of how things have changed so much i mean for uh, i think from the 90s 80s 70s is pretty much been standard you know there've been restaurants which have been around forever gay lords in bombay and and uh, uh, you had berries and you had those ways uh, society at the horizon and then suddenly boom from 10 years ago everything has changed drastically so when you walk us through what you think has changed and evolved in the dining scene in in uh, india and even bombay to be more specific as for me personally speaking uh, there's a lot which has changed in terms of foreign flavors which have come into india and that could be attributed to a simple television to the power of media to the sheer fact that a lot of indians have traveled abroad and are still traveling abroad so the one thing that uh, i would like personally to highlight upon would be uh, the influx of mediterranean food mediterranean flavors primarily because those are again very very strong flavors uh, that uh, are associated with any cuisine uh, from that particular region and that has kind of transcended into our own being as uh, a big uh, bold flavor of be it peppers be it uh, garlic be it anchovy so that's one thing which i have noticed has has come into being the big bold mediterranean flavors anchovies does that go down well uh, with the indian palate uh, any connoisseur uh, who would have had a classic caesar anywhere in the world uh, would remember the flavor of anchovies and again uh, anchovies is something which is uh, it's got resonance all over the world for example in a fish sauce uh, in in a thai cuisine you would have that particular fish uh, flavor which is of fermented fish and anchovies as a bold flavor are not very very far from there right yeah uh, we also have a tradition of drying our fishes and bombils and stuff like that there you go yeah which which are not very far away in flavor profiling sure so you you uh, you are you are you're betting that mediterranean food is is what what you see catching up uh catching the imagination of indian consumers the most sure i mean you know uh, be it uh, moshes be it the uh, pizza places be it the uh, mediterranean uh, uh, noodle houses be it uh, cheeses be it influx of mediterranean inspired products in horeca uh, you see it almost everywhere olives olive oil uh, risotto rice everywhere thank you uh, gauri uh, what how do you have seen the, the food change evolve in the last decade um well for starters i've been part of this uh industry for all of 3 or 4 years so i can't say that i've seen uh you know i've witnessed a huge change i think i'd be speaking more from a from a personal perspective and then obviously what i've seen with the restaurant over the last 3 years um i completely agree with uh with what what chef pandey said which is that um you know people firstly are much more well traveled now so when they're having a, a cuisine that they sort of you know that's that's indigenous to you know a foreign country in in india then they've begun to expect 
um, higher standards because they've had sort of what's authentic probably. Um, so people, people, you know, expect that. And I think that's, uh, that's definitely also um, supported by the fact that we have importers now who are making those ingredients available to be able to give you an authentic, give the consumer an authentic product. So it's, it's the whole industry is changing. It's not just the consumer who's expecting a higher quality product, but it's also that, you know, it's being made available uh, throughout the supply chain. And that's a reflection of um, a, a more refined palette um, and not one that is sort of, you know, uh, what, what people have generically called uh, sort of Indianized um, uh, food, and uh, I think I think it's it's great. So you know, it 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 definitely is a bigger challenge for chefs um, to to you know keep up with quality, consistency, and just provide um, you know a really good product, whatever the cuisine is, whatever your sort of restaurant is catering to. Um, and but I I definitely think that there's uh, a, a much more refined palate. Um, between our, you know, uh, and, and uh, just start, what do you mean when you say refined palate? Uh, what, I think what? that um, you know people aren't so much uh, sort of expecting strong flavors. They they want uh, you know you could be having uh, you know you could be having a steak which is just steak. It's it's not necessarily got a, a strong sauce going with it. It's not got you know um, so many accompaniments. It's just you know they're willing to experiment with. Uh, really, uh, you know, I mean, if you see, for example, uh, um, uh, the, the sort of increasing number of restaurants doing sushi, uh, I don't think sort of Indians were so uh, open to having raw seafood um, till, you know, a few years ago. And now that's become uh, an increasing um, uh, sort of, uh, uh, you know, trend here. And um, I just think that it's not so, it's, it's just that people are, they expect a great quality, uh, you know, they expect great quality. And if, if you're able to provide that, people are open to trying new things and not sort of expecting uh, familiar tastes necessarily, but, you know, being open to, um, to new, new tastes, new, new flavors. I always see um, sushi in our country being served with red chili powder. Yeah, yeah. No way, I've it, never seen that. I don't know where you eat. <laughs> no, it's true. Go to any, and most of this, you even go to wasabi right now, they, they give you red chili. It's true. You people eat chili, I take chili, chili that back oil back. With, with dim sums doused in that stuff. Well, um, How many times people ask for Tabasco in your restaurant? Well, okay, it's becoming less and less because we, we sort of almost always refuse to give it. So, um, yeah, well, we, we, or rather we discourage it um, and we encourage people to try what we, the way, you know, we, pre we prepared it. And so, um, yeah, but it's, it's a tough one. <laughs> Hi, good afternoon. Uh, here, I would like to say, I don't few things like... Uh, India has become globalized and uh, this globalization has gotten us a lot of foreign investment and overseas traveler. All this overseas traveler uh, coming to us, again, as in chef to appease them, very important for us to work towards their palate so they get their home food, which is for us is a foreign food. And uh, there was a time when all these things were available in a classy five-star restaurants only. But uh, going ahead now, the influx of foreign tourists is quite high, so we can see a lot of restaurants opening, like rightly said, uh, a sushi, one thing. A lot of Japanese guests coming in, so we have a sushi, but at the same point of our time, uh, a traditional cultural rich India has a lot of vegetarian client and we need to cater to them. So we again see a few restaurants doing a nice vegetarian sushi and uh, as a matter of fact, Japanese guests themselves, they have liked it. So I think there is a small little twist that we need to do it and it's uh, very important. Taking care that not losing your basic flavors and the authenticity of a product. So that is how is a way to go ahead, I feel. Mm. I would give a very good example about uh, Ahmedabad market. Ahmedabad market has recently seen a lot of, uh, again, a Japanese client. And uh, sushi is something in a typical uh, Gujarati market which is dominantly a vegetarian is something unheard of. Yeah. So that is that. And uh, if I go a generation back, where 
people are well traveled of course but then they are not uh, willing to try a foreign food i would say so the safest bet for them comes in a some similarity in the basic ingredient something like a thai curry which has got a uh, chilies coconut and pepper which we are familiar with so the slowly that fear of unknown is going away from the indian palate indian customer i would say and that is what is ticking in chef um, you mentioned that uh, the, we are offering international cuisine to cater primarily to tourists but i, I would guess that still about 75% of your customer base would um, uh, which are not restaurant guests would be uh, locals uh i would say for me it is around uh, 60 40 60% is a global client and 40 is a local now for the local client it's very important that uh, since they have traveled well and they want to have a let's say a bolognese they get the authentic bolognese what they would have eaten in sicily or a tuscany somewhere or a pesto which is the pesto which comes from geneva so that is what our local client look for the authenticity of a product so chef pai uh, you've had a lot of experience uh, how have you seen things change in the early part of your career to to in the recent years uh, uh, well uh, what i can say is that now the end customer has got the knowledge you know exactly what when you say sushi how it should taste like there's inf information in abundance you see a tv channel you see a magazine this full of information people are traveling uh, so whatever you saw so what the demand for quality the demand for uh, authenticity is of course coming having said that there are a lot of new cuisines like mediterranean japanese which are coming out but that depends on which segment of the market so even today 70% of food which is sold in india across uh, hotels or uh, fine dining restaurants is indian food but what i can say is uh, yet there is a change here people want to taste indian food but what is important aspect in any cuisine which is going to come to india in 2014 is health nutrition okay that's very very important because people if you see uh, for example i worked for a hotel which is uh, uh, it's it's versatile there are koreans there are chinese there are indians 50 50 you know so when you just put a breakfast buffet it is so difficult you have to make sure that every element uh, which the people like to eat for breakfast has to be there and again then when you when you are working for a mid market brand or not a luxury hotel you won't have specialized people making exactly their authentic food but our goal is always to strive towards uh, reaching authenticity and make sure that we give the customer exactly what he wants so uh, in 2014 i have seen is more and more indian restaurant coming up but uh, with more focus the way indian food is presented in an international manner so that it it is in the level of all the cuisines which are served abroad and even if a western or european who comes down to india he the first thing the first quality of food which the best food will served in india will be indian cuisine everything will be second okay because uh, the indians here making an indian cuisine is so huge that uh, it uh, uh, mostly it is north indian cuisine which is uh, which is well known but today there are innovative chefs the new breed chefs who are, who are using international technology okay they using international equipment like sous vide molecular gastronomy and bringing the international uh, indian cuisine to the international levels so i feel that the way to go is uh, of course with the new cuisines coming in yet if you if anybody sitting in this audience if you consider seven days if you are having food i'm sure three to four days we all eat indian food you know you are not happy uh, if you don't have indian you will try mediterranean you will try lebanese but at the end of the day you will not be satisfied unless you have had at least three times in a week uh, indian food yeah we we keep coming back to our dal chawal don't we we, we love it um one word i heard uh, everybody used was uh, authenticity uh, i I'm, i've always been a little confused about the word authenticity i, I really don't know what that is because i i've spent some time in italy and uh, i haven't met two italians who agreed on you know which is the best way of making a simple pasta so i mean what what really uh, is termed as authentic uh, you know because we really don't know whether this is so there's a general sense of okay you know this is how it should taste like but i i think that every household carries a, a slightly different variant of um, a particular classic dish even and everybody has their own little you know secret ingredient which which they like to add so uh, when you're always confronted with i think this is one of the biggest challenges most chefs face is uh, whether we should be authentic or whether we should try and cater 
to a flavor profile that customers have come to expect. Uh, culturally, growing up in uh, India, you're always exposed to really bold flavors. We don't, we don't hold back when it comes to flavors and spices. We really load it on. Uh, whereas maybe uh, Western culture is more uh, concerned with minimalist, minimalistic intervention and, and tasting the ingredient and keeping it pure. So uh, it has been my experience as a standalone restaurant here uh, that there are two kinds of things. You, there's a dish that you want to serve and the dish that people will like at, at the last dish. So um, I don't know, I think five stars are a little, uh, you know, protected because they have, you know, a large uh, international customer base which is in-house walking into them. But Gauri, let me ask you as a standalone restaurant here, what is the dilemma and how do you, how do you cope with it on a daily basis? Um, I think that, uh, well, okay, so at the, at the table has always been, um, uh, you know, we've got a menu that isn't, it, it's very eclectic, it's probably not a lot of things that you'll recognize. Um, uh, so I actually, I, I understand what you're saying about authenticity because, um, it, that, that sort of comes into more traditional cuisine, more traditional dishes where people can compare it in, in uh, you know, between different restaurants, uh, you know, say a simple, I don't know, a, a, a simple sort of pizza or, um, you know, a pasta which you expect to be made in a certain way. Um, whereas with us, we've always sort of, uh, I think, uh, gone sort of, uh, a bit, yeah, against the grain. Um, and I think... <laughs> um, I think creativity uh, has been sort of uh, very key with what we've tried to do, which is not give anyone something that they may have had before. Uh, so then you're not trying to, you know, you're, you're not trying to, you know, you're, you're trying to avoid that comparison altogether. Um, it's not with that purpose, but that's, I think, where we are today, which is that uh, it's something completely, it's a completely different product. and. The fact that people are open to that is, uh, I, I, I mean, that's, that's been the, the best sort of, uh, you know, um, sort of reinforcement for us to keep doing what we're doing, which is that, you know, people are really open to trying something completely different. Um, so we haven't really had that issue so much of having to sort of whether we do what, what we want to do or go with what people uh, expect from us because we pretty much always veered towards, um, you know, doing the unexpected, I guess. And that's very interesting that you don't, you don't start off with a label of, of authenticity. You start off with uh, a premise of, of innovation and uh, eclectic. And I think that kind of uh, changes things around. Shapandi, what have you, your experiences been between the authentic and the eclectic and catering to local flavors? Uh, for me, uh, a dal makhni with chipotle butter is not authentic. You know, let me just put it nice, plain and simple way. A dal makhni is supposed to be dal makhni and there's no two ways about it. Yes, uh, there are certain restaurants who might not use a clarified or a home churn butter to do their dal makhni or might not, as advertised, put it on a tandoor for 48 hours or overnight. But then a dal makhni is a dal makhni and that's the way it should be made. So that's the authenticity part. Now, coming to your, uh, the, the second observation that, you know, how do we cater to uh, various palates? Do we present them with a dish and say, listen, that's the way it is supposed to be prepared, eat it or leave it? Uh, I'll just give you an example. Uh, we very often in an Italian restaurant uh, get asked for a spicier pasta. Now, again, Italian cuisine, by the virtue of being Italian cuisine, gives us a lot of leeways. For example, you can serve and arabiata, which everybody knows, is tomatoes, garlic, and chilies. Or you could have a nice, simple aglio which would again be garlic and chilies, but without the tomato sauce. So again, if somebody wants something done to their pasta, there are examples in the cuisine itself, which can be suggested to that particular guest or that particular palate without compromising on the essence of the cuisine, which kind of uh, works better for us because uh, it's, it makes both of us happy. The guest is happy and we do not have to compromise on giving him something which is not as per the cuisine. So you're open to modification? Sure, open to a modification if the cuisine offers it. I mean, it, we, we have to stay true to the cuisine, otherwise there's no point 
uh, doing a penne pasta in a makhni gravy just to please a person who's come down with no offense from sector 18 in Chandigarh. But I, I think that uh, penne pasta with dal makhni sounds yum, doesn't it? No, penne pasta with uh, makhni gravy, I've, I've had it and it's yum. I know a very, very senior person in uh, Punjab political circles who loves it and I made it for him as well. But then that's about it. I mean, at the end of the day, if you think about it, it's, it's, it's the structure is, is very similar. You, you having some carbs with your protein and you have some sauce and you need something that fills your stomach, which is, you know, our, our roti or bread. Uh, and for Italians, it's pasta. And I think that, that that's what I think we're really coming to now is so much possible with the world being your pantry. I mean, we all this time labored under this very heavy weight of authenticity because we had no choice to work with, uh, with local ingredients, right? We were, ingredients were only available locally, so your food then reflected and, you know, your skills came with what you could do with those ingredients. But now the world is your pantry. And, uh, you know, we can be as experimentative. So, what's the craziest dish you ever made? Something like uh, pasta with dal makhani? No, uh, unfortunately, I am a strong believer in the authenticity. The way it should be, the way I would say the grandma used to make it. So, instead of doing that, I would rather use the Indian produce to produce something uh, international, something like a finger millet. If I tell someone a ragi, it, everybody looks down on it. Oh, it's one of the cheap ingredients. But then you mix this ragi with certain pumpkin seeds and uh, linseed and make a nice bread out of it, it becomes a wow factor. So, I personally like to do something like that instead of uh, changing what it should be. So, same thing goes with your, let's say, a Thai curry or a South Indian food. You do a good presentation. Do not change the recipe, do not change the taste. I would say that because a guest would come to me and pay for what? for the product that he wants to eat. If he wants to eat a good Thai curry, he wants to eat a good Thai curry. But then also uh, sometimes uh, people go and uh, uh, they, they go in for the chef, uh, chef's interpretation or his styling of cuisine. And I think, um, I think there's a market for both. Uh, uh, chef Pai, have you seen uh, customers coming and just willing to put themselves in your hands and say, but you, you feed us or are you more air on the conservative side. That's only if he has already been there and he has, uh, otherwise it's very difficult because uh, uh, that's why when you see authenticity, we uh, now we are in working for a hotel, it's a business traveler. He does not have time, he's there two nights with the hotel or one night. So the name should be familiar, okay, what is written on the menu and it should be at least close to what his expectations are. Whereas in a fine dining, standalone restaurant, not necessarily because they say this is our style of cooking, you know, and this is fine dining, so you can say this is the way we do it. But then we say uh, in a five-star hotel, a club sandwich generally expected that these fillings should be there. What you can change is one ingredient. So actually the authenticity is not decided by the chef. It is the class, whether that classical dish, how much can be distort that recipe and how much the customer will ex ex accept it. That is the authenticity. It's not decided that I can't change Rogan juice because it is fixed in his mind that when you say it's nice and slurpy, ripe chilies with some oil floating. So suddenly, yes, but that, that is authenticity. The authenticity, the recipe slowly, slowly evolves and eventually it will change one day whether, for example, uh, uh, original Rogan Joe's does not have tomato in the recipe at all. But I, I, I can say every hotel uses tomato puree because you use pure chili and yogurt, you will never able to digest in Mumbai. So this is not authentic. But with the tomato, the recipe has become authentic. So there's nothing called authentic, you rightly said. It is all uh, how you evolve day by day based on what the customer expects. It's um, hard now to imagine Indian cuisine without tomatoes, but um, the fact is that tomatoes have not been around. Yeah, it's not an Indian vegetable at all, but it's just made its way uh, into virtually every uh, dish today uh, that, that you do. So, I mean, uh, here's a thought, okay? I mean, you look at um, the top 10, I mean, the San Pellegrino list of the top 50 restaurants, which is now generally ex accepted as a... Uh, uh, a kind of industry standard for best rated restaurants. I mean, the, and um, all the restaurants that you see in the top 10, uh, no one is doing anything authentic. There, everybody is going uh, for the chef's interpretation or the chef's style of, of food and his, his philosophy. And I think a lot of, and of course, they use modern techniques. And 
Uh, some of them, like uh, Farhan Adria, would tell you that he uses his influences, but he modernizes it. Um, so, which way are you are you thinking that I mean, one day, if you had your own restaurant, Chef Bande, would you do something which is more customer focused, or would you follow your heart and your philosophy and create a restaurant? If you're not attached to a five star, I know that comes with, uh, you know, it's uh, it's requirements of of pleasing the guests, but. If you were to open up your own small 40-seater restaurant, what would you do? Well, if I ever had a chance and the money, of course, to open my own 40-seater restaurant, it would obviously be a, a, a business restaurant with a soul. I mean, that's how I would uh, describe it. And the soul of the restaurant would be from the purity of ingredients, the efforts of the chef, and obviously it will be an area which would be a fairly uh, open catchment area wherein the guests would come knowing that the food, even if it's not authentic, would be honest. So the ingredients would be honest, the efforts would be honest, the cuisine would be honest. The, and and uh, the whole philosophy behind eating in that food uh, would, would, would bring pleasure to your heart, would bring a smile to your lips. I know it sounds like a poem, but then, uh, you know, that's what uh, my ideal restaurant would be. So it would be very, very honest ingredients and very, very honest techniques. Honest as in like food that won't steal from you? No, I mean, honest ingredients is, you know, if I, if I say something which is uh, uh, grown within 40 kilometers of where my restaurant is, it uh, should be within 40 kilometers where my restaurant is. It should not be that, you know, I'm smuggling it in or flying it out uh, from uh, London, for example. Gauri, you wanted to add something? Yeah, I just wanted to say, I mean, I think it's really hard for a restaurant to uh, define itself um, based on on purely on what a cus on what on, on what customers expect because today your customer wants this and tomorrow your customer wants something else and wh how, what are you I mean you know you have to define yourself first uh, you know with with integrity as you say based on what you want to do and what you want to offer and the reality uh, is that you're never ever going to be able to please everyone so you know that's just something that. I realize that you have to, you know, sort of uh, accept, and uh, you got to do what you want to do. And those who, you know, you do it with integrity and honesty. As I, I completely understand what you're saying. Um, and then those who enjoy that, and you know, uh, uh, it, it sort of appeals to them, will keep coming back. Exactly. And that, and you know, I think that they appreciate, they'll appreciate what you're doing. Um, for, you know, because you're doing, and you'll do it better if it's something that you want to do. And if you're doing it just to please someone else, it's, it's you know, um, I think it, it'll, it'll never be quite the same. And it, it's just something that'll keep changing. You have to define what your restaurant is about yourself, not, not um, have other people define it for you, I think. Uh, obviously, Gauri, you are uh, walking the talk. You are, you are running a restaurant which is very different and it, it, I think in the beginning everybody found it very difficult to slot you in and I'm pretty sure that they keep facing that and in all these award shows uh, they don't know where to put you. <laughs> uh, but yeah, but she, you are actually, you have a very definite philosophy of your kind of cuisine and this fresh, uh, healthy Californian influenced cuisine, would you say? Yeah, I think that's it. Um, you know, I, I think the, for us, uh, I, I, we, we did struggle with that because people wanted to know, you know, so what cuisine are you? And we were like, well, it's, it's, a, it's a globally inspired menu. It takes inspiration from many different cuisines. So, you know, and, and the chef has the freedom to sort of do what, what, um, what he wants. So um, I, I think that, uh, but the, the way the restaurant sort of, uh, I think the restaurant success just goes to show that that customers are actually that that does appeal to customers, and you know they're open to that that philosophy. Uh, chef, very quickly, uh, what would your restaurant be? Oh. I would say if I open a restaurant, it's for the commercial success for sure. So one thing I have to keep it in mind: what my customer likes. One thing, and of course, if I open a restaurant. I need to do something which is my signature. So I have to show my creativity. So for me, the menu mix will be something around 25 to 30 percent what I want to do. And some part of it would be, let's say, around 50 percent what customer wants looking from the market. And the base part will be around 20 percent, I would say, to earn your basic bread and butter to give the run of a meal product which sells, basically. 
It's a clever strategy. First, you give them what they want, and then you slip in what you want, and then hopefully they'll come back for what you want to give them. I, I would say it's a soft market. First, uh, get them accustomed to what I want to do. Let mm. them have a look. If they like it, then we can always grow on that selection. Very cutting chef. Right. Chef Pai. What I feel, it's very important to innovate and evolve. Every cuisine must go through a subtle changes, but wisdom lies in knowing where to stop. Okay. A cuisine shouldn't change so much that the uniqueness and the essence of the uh, uh, cuisine itself is lost. So basically, if you're saying a matron restaurant, and uh, you know, at least you should have focus on the, uh, what, is, what are the ingredients of the My, my question was, uh, if you were to open up your own restaurant, okay. and no, you know, no baggage of a five-star, uh, what kind of food would you serve? Would you serve something that comes I, I from your it. own beliefs and styles and philosophy or would you try and, and cater to the customers? No, uh, first of yeah. all, I will open a restaurant what I like to do. With being a chef, I should enjoy doing it every day in the kitchen. So my favorite would be opening a seafood restaurant Excellent. and uh, maybe giving the guest uh, not only the choice of Indian but uh, giving him all the flavors of, of so you'd, you, it'd be more in the ingredient centric rather than cuisine centric. It's cuisine so. centric, because that is where you give uh, you the happiness uh, to work in that kitchen. I think that's Not, a very. You know, I won't think like a businessman. I would think like a chef. You know, yeah. that's a very interesting idea. I think that is is going to happen. Um, there's also a term which is called locavore, which was just added, and you know we always uh, we don't take a lot of pride in our ingredients which are grown locally. We're always saying Italian uh, pasta hai or New Zealand lamb chops are there and but we don't seem to get, we never ever say, you know, it's, it's something which, we, which grows around Pune or something around the growth Maharashtra or we're going to focus with a uh, hundred kilometers of our restaurant. Why is that? Uh, the problem is when we work for hotels is if you got plenty of vegetables which are very seasonal. If you see during the monsoon there are a lot of shrubs, uh, there are a lot of herbs which come which locally my wife goes and picks up from the market. But sitting in the hotel, it's not like uh, working for a standalone. There's a purchase department, there's a yearly tender, and if you have this particular item on the menu, it'll never come. It never come. So the chef won't be adventurous, and, and the chef has not got the time to go out because here you're catering for banquet. Here. Whereas if you own a restaurant and if you're responsible, you'll make sure that you'll have a vendor. You know. Whereas there are a lot of systems and processes which are followed. So something which can be supplied year long, only those products we can use. Uh, otherwise, there are fantastic products, but uh, in today's scenario, you see a normal Himachal apples are not available. I don't get normal oranges. Even if I want to use Indian oranges, it's not available. The supplier says it's not there. In the crop and market, you'll get it. But for a hotel supply, he does not supply. So unfortunately, the market is such uh, that uh, you have all imported vegetables, even if you want to uh, buy it for the hotel, because the vendor doesn't provide. You can go shopping to the local market, you'll get it. But for a hotel vendor, he does not supply local like Lal Mart, okay, like Chowli. They're fantastic greens yeah, which are available. Chowli is an amazing, fantastic very vegetable. Underrated. You know, but if I were to have it on my menu, I have to receive it fresh every day in the morning, okay. Uh, similarly with seafood, they're what you get in uh, the hotels is very limited seafood. So what happens is then uh, the chef is limited to create a menu. He rather depends on frozen, well-packed ingredients which you get from abroad. He tries to make his menu out of those then working on a local, uh, but if uh, it's a chef-centric business where he owns the restaurant, he's the decision maker, he, he can surely do that. Yeah. Anybody want to add anything to that? I would like to add something here that uh, I've been fortunate enough uh, with a good uh, materials department and uh, support from the hotel that I have been able to source out all this local product as and when available. Only pro problem is that the sustainability in Indian market. We do not get this product of the same quality over a period of time. So that's when actually the restriction comes in. Talking about the seafood which Chef Pai just mentioned, I mean, hotels are a little bit of a different ball game because uh, we have to have it supplied from a vendor who has submitted us a tender, whom we have uh, audited in terms of its premises for hygiene, whom, who has to give us an FSSAI, approved certificate, et cetera, et cetera. So it's not as easy as going to that supplier and picking up the catch of the day. So hotels, it becomes a little bit of a situation. Sir. 
So I completely understand that, uh, you know, the scale that hotels work on, and that's one of the advantages that a standalone restaurant does have, uh, which is that you're working with less quantities. So we, in fact, do have um, what we call refer to as the table farm. Um, it's, uh, it's in Alibag, and uh, we've started growing a lot of the produce which we use in the restaurant um, there. And uh, it's not something that, you know, the restaurant can completely sustain, uh, you know, itself on. But uh, that's, you know, the, the long-term target. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I, it makes a world of difference to be able to do that. Um, so, you know, hopefully... And then you have, you do have producers who are now doing that. You know, you've got your Trikayas and uh, Green Tokri and things. So hopefully that's just going to happen on a larger scale where you can get your produce... Uh, locally fresh, uh, you know, you can work with your suppliers to grow what you want and, uh, you know, hopefully we'll get there where it'll just reduce costs as well and the quality is just, you know, uh, unbelievable when it's local. Um, so, the conclusion I'm drawing from our conversation today is that um, a lot of chefs are facing, uh, you know, and looking all over the world to, to draw inspiration and present it took uh, local uh, pilots as well as international travelers. Um, we are facing uh, a certain uh, shortage of good uh, supply chain and therefore local innovation is going to take a, is a little far away. And I think that uh, standalones are going to be leading the way and, uh, you know, and, and leading the way when it comes to innovation and five stars are going to have to catch up a little bit uh, in that frame. Uh, anybody have any questions uh, for our panel? Could you just wait for the mic to come up to you, please? Yeah. Hi there. Firstly, thank you very much. Very interesting conversations. Um, all of your restaurants, be it in hotels or standalones, are seemingly quite dependent on imported foods. Um, as we all know, there's been certain challenges with imports of food products uh, throughout last year. Um, <clears throat> to, what sorry, to what extent has that affected um, the types of foods that you're able to put on your plates and are you going to change the, the composition of your products going forward? Who wants to take that? Uh, so, sorry, you meant that uh, because of the uh, dearth of imported products, has it affected us? Is that what you're trying well, to ask? Well, there's certain difficulties in imports of products um, that many importers are facing. Therefore, they're your suppliers in your restaurants, have you found that there is a shortage of ingredients that you require to do international cuisine? Sure. Uh, the chain which I work for, Marriott, uh, we have hotels in Mumbai, uh, we have hotels in Pune, and we have hotels in Bangalore, and we are almost uh, 14, 15 hotels strong if we cover these three uh, cities. So what we have done is we have got a central purchasing department which deals with purveyors, suppliers directly, and we try and get a lot of uh, food products, especially the imported ones, directly ourselves as well. So that helps us because it just gives us a little bit extra muscle. That's all. Does that answer your question? Um, I'll just add to that that I, we, we faced a huge problem because of the, um, the restrictions with imported products. And uh, one of the things that we've done from the very beginning is that we have a daily changing menu. Um, because we just have to adapt. So, you know, whether it's creating new dishes and taking other dishes off the menu or, um, you know, trying different products, um, you know, without compromising on quality. But that's definitely something that we've had to do in the last sort of six months increasingly uh, because of this, the challenge with imported products. Yeah. I've got a question. When onion prices and tomato prices... So could you hold up the mic, please? Yeah. When onion and tomato prices soared up to around 80 to 100 bucks per kg, so what all you did? Uh, you must have got a, uh, maybe, uh, instruction from your materials department to use lace, or uh, how did you uh, adjust with the situation? I'm sorry, I, I was not very... I couldn't hear the question very clearly. If you could uh, just... Uh, the, the question I'm asking is, when onion prices, onion and tomato, they went up to around 80 to 100 bucks per kg just recent past one or two months back. So how did you uh, deal with the situation so far as menu is concerned and your material departments are concerned? So how do chefs ensure that inflation is not uh, passed on to the consumer, I guess? Yeah. 
Actually, here I would like to say it's a flip side of being in the business and uh, we cannot pass everything to down to the consumer end of the day. So, we had to absorb and uh, these are the one of the turbulent time for the business and we have to live through it. I think most restaurants have absorbed uh, all the inflationary costs, especially in food. And I think uh, we've just kept absorbing it uh, as much as we can. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead, sir. Uh, uh, so, thanks for a very appetizing discussion. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, one, since uh, most of you represent either the hospitality industry or some kind of designer concepts, uh, but I'm sure you are exposed to what's happening in the mass uh, world also on QSR casual dine format. How different is the trend uh, there compared to hospitality or designer where people come with an awareness and with the capacity? to pay. So that's one question. And the second question was, uh, earlier there used to be a, a preference for a particular cuisine. It used to be, give me a Chinese cuisine, do you have Mexican? But uh, my uh, observation, uh, being in the industry, it, uh, it goes that you find people asking for particular flavors from a cuisine, not a cuisine as a whole. They say that, what do you, I mean, what do you have in Chipotle? What do you have in uh, tahina? Can you make tahina? Can you make uh, uh, teriyaki? So if they are asking uh, for flavors, not a cuisine, then uh, don't you think fusion is a uh, uh, much practical and uh, uh, practical or faster way to, I mean, uh, to develop the cuisine and give, uh, give the kind of flavors of the world feel under one? Can I, uh, I'll address that. I feel um, eating, there's no one correct way or one only way, you know. I mean, uh, today I sometimes feel like a McDonald's burger. I know it's whatever, but I still do feel like it. Because, and I know that if I go to a QSR restaurant, I'm going to get the same bad burger and I'm going to eat it and I'm going to enjoy it because I know what it is. Right? I'm going there for what it is. Uh, there are going to be restaurants, I, I have noticed there has been an upsurge of uh, multi-cuisine restaurants which are coming back. You know, we went from an uh, era which was 12 years ago where we, there were only multi-cuisine restaurants. All the good ones used to serve you Indian, Chinese and Conti. Okay? And uh, now, I think that uh, we went into an era where there was more specialization. You know, there was a focus on North Italian, South Italian, uh, Mexican, and there was areas of specialization. I think now, recently, again, you, you're seeing a trend emerge of uh, specialized multi-cuisine restaurants, so multi-cuisine restaurants which are doing a lot of research and are creating as much authentic cuisine as possible. So, and, and I, just, I just think that there's, uh, there's no one particular good way of eating and a, a restaurant which defines itself very clearly and lays down expectations and when the customer is in mood for something, so when a customer is in mood for an authentic Indian, he's going to a restaurant which positions itself as an authentic Indian restaurant. When a customer is in mood for, you know, let's say, innovative Californian cuisine, he's going to go to Gauri's restaurant table and he's going to enjoy something there, you know. So it really depends. I think a, a restaurant has to be very clear about what it is. Uh, I, I find the greatest failure rate among restaurants are restaurants which are either trying to be everything or, or, or are very confused about what they really are. I think it's very important to first, A, be clear about what is the kind of food that you're going to deliver, whether it's authentic, experimental, fusion, whatever. And then communicate that very clearly to your customer. So when you are in the mood for fusion, you'll go to a fusion restaurant. You know, but when you're in the mood for something authentic, you'll go to an authentic restaurant. But I don't think one restaurant fits all in that sense. All right. So uh, a cup, one more question. Yes, ma'am. We're running out of time, so we'll just go Sure, ahead. it'll be a quick question. More, f not for the standalone uh, restaurants, but more for people who are operating in the space in, in hotels. Um, are you uh, typically looking to follow some of the standards that are set uh, by your counterparts in other geographies? So, for example, I know that Marriott runs the Choose Wisely campaign on its fish, and suddenly we hear a lot of John Dory on the menu, and Basa has taken, you know, the restaurant business by storm. Uh, do you necessarily need to follow some of those trends to, to ensure that you're still relevant in the fine dining, um, high-end space? Uh, well, in, 
in our case, in our case uh, you rightly said that Basa has uh, taken over. A very, uh, very beautiful pomfret and surma is not more available. It's about 1,500 rupees a kg. Uh, the best fish curry you get in India or any fish preparation in Mumbai sitting here is out of a, a fresh pomfret or a kingfish. But unfortunately, it's become so expensive. And uh, it depends on hotels to hotels of what uh, segment they're catering to. For example, our hotel uh, is the major segment is mice, which is conferences mostly pharmaceutical companies, insurance companies, day in and day out there are meetings, we're feeding hundreds and hundreds of people. It's the economics, the cost, what is involved. So obviously we look for products which are cost effective and that's why Basa has taken over because it's all coming away from Cambodia and still it is sold at 210 rupees kilo. And our pomfret and uh, kingfish is sold at 1,500 rupees a kg. <coughs> and yet it does not come in the right condition, you know, the, the way it comes in, it's, uh, the cold chain is not maintained. The quantities are very, very huge. We cater to about 700 people in a day. And everywhere there's a fish, second uh, meat option is a fish. And uh, you can't imagine to uh, uh, serve pomfret at the price. With the increase in price of onion, tomatoes, there's been a 25% increase in the food ingredients. I have exactly different categories in 2014. What is the dairy increase? What is the seafood increase? We get an uh, indicator from the food cost controller, which are the areas. So how do we create a menu mix? So, like you said, we have to keep changing and we have to, so this year, Basa, next year maybe something else, some other country, China will come out with some fish and they will start supplying, who knows. But we can't uh, get our own surma, we can't get our own pomfret because they are all going to the Middle East. So, would you say that we were not choosing wisely and you think that… No, uh, the demand is such that uh, maybe they are getting more money by sending it outside, you know. Uh, you see where is 210 rupees a kg. In fact, about four or five years back, we had a fantastic bhakti which used to come from uh, Calcutta. Now it's extinct. It's not available in Mumbai. There's no bhakti, okay. So it keeps on changing uh, based on where the demand comes from and where the trader uh, ships it. Uh, uh, I think uh, a lot of this also has to do with infrastructure. Uh, we uh, at the restaurant business are suffering from last mile connectivity when it comes to even cold chain. And you know, I mean things like sustainability and provenance are not really taking hold of, of um, you know, our culture. I think we are, we are more, uh, our entire agricultural e economy <coughs> is more uh, concerned with, with yield uh, rather than artisanal. Uh, you know, so it, it, it's a slow process, you're beginning to see you know, changes happen, the, the vendors, we, we cook ingredients which are available to us. Uh, she has created her own farm, so she's doing her bit. Uh, as restaurateurs, we are trying to work with vendors. We do try and explain to them, that, look, this is what we want. But by large, the agricultural economy as of now is, is, is more concerned with just churning out produce and yield and, and less focused on artisanal quality and heirloom and, and stuff like that. But, it, you know, having said that, give, give it a while, give it a while, yeah. Okay, I guess uh, we are completely out of time, but before we wrap up, uh, you know, Riaz got to ans uh, ask all the questions. One question to Riaz as someone who actually puts money behind new formats, new chains. It's very easy to ask a chef, what do you think will happen? But as somebody who has to put his money, fund these restaurants and replicate on a scalable basis, how are you spotting the trend? Are you just going by the template model if it is Mediterranean, Italian, replicate that? Where are you being able to or how much freedom do you have to push the board and then make sure that your money gives returns? Um, I think uh, w what has really changed the most in the last 12 years has been the fact that uh, earlier good food was primarily the exclusive domain of five stars. Uh, now with standalones which are coming in, you, you are getting really, really good food but also you're getting it in cafe style restaurants, uh, which means that I'm getting very good quality oriental food, but I'm getting it at cafe prices, which, which means that my average spend per person is between 500 to 600. I'm not breaking a bank. You know, I can afford to eat that regularly. So I think my, the real trend is, I think you will, you will get definitely have uh, a cuisine, with, uh, a culture where people want to experiment with new flavors, new, new tastes, but in a cafe style. So I think that the biggest trend which I'm seeing for going forward, fine dining restaurants are going to come down and they're going to face immense competition with a casual cafe style restaurant serving really good uh, food at 
affordable prices. And that's the, that's the future. And in, in that sense of uh, authenticity that you talked about, you raised with the chefs, do you think uh, the format that you are going for will have more experimentation because that will have a bearing on how people's mass taste changes? Because not everybody has to go to a hotel to taste authenticity, but experimentation with authenticity can happen more at your level and the kind of format that you are pushing. Like I said, you just have to be very clear about what you want to do. I, uh, there will be an audience for uh, a restaurant which is experimentative and there will be an audience for an, a restaurant which is authentic. As long as people know what they're coming in for, I think that's it. You just have to let people know. You have to let people know that, look, you know what, we're not doing anything authentic. Like, like Gauri very clearly said, look, we're not, we're not writing that. We, we have a f food philosophy and we're doing something. We're doing innovative things and people go to her restaurant to try that cuisine. So be honest and be transparent. Ladies and gentlemen, give a huge round of applause to a very, very interesting panel led by Riyaz Zamlani. Thank you, Riyaz, for hosting it, for moderating it.